Hello, parents. Hello, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, today, we have a very special event for you guys. And we're going to be talking about a lot of topics that are so important for you as targeted parents. Uh, we're going to talk about, um, you know, parent parenting time, we're going to talk about parent child interaction, um, talking about parent child relationship, um, the children emotional security, parenting, parent conflict and domestic violence, mm -hmm. and how all of that's impacting the children. And um, hopefully that will also help you figure out how to improve your relationship with your children. And with us today, we have um, an amazing guest, and we're really honored to have uh, Dr. Fabricius with us. He's a developmental psychologist from Arizona State University. Uh, hello, Dr. Fabricius. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And um, thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. You guys, uh, if you could please let us know if you could hear us okay and where you're calling in from. Again, I'm having problem finding where the comments are. Uh, give me one second. I want to make sure I can see it. Um, yeah, I don't know why I've been doing this for so long and um, every time I have trouble seeing where the comments like Facebook, like I used to be able to have no more trouble finding it and recently something changed and now I every time I, I have to like move things around and try to find where the comments are. And let's see. I know there's people watching, but I, I can't, this is so strange, I'm sorry, every time. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Okay, let's see. Sorry, I'm going to try this again. Uh, yeah, because I don't want to, to go on until we know that, um, that we have proper audio that you could hear is okay. Um, Okay, I think I go to a different place and I think there are comments, but I can't see it. Oh, okay, good, good. Thank you, Nithi said um, she could hear us uh, clear. Jen from Denmark say loud and clear. Um, Tia uh, Bravery from Texas, thank you. Uh, someone, yeah, I lost the comment, but okay, so where i'm supposed to see the comments i still haven't figured out but i'm looking at the comments at a different place so anyway guys okay thank you so much and for letting us know that, that you could hear okay so um before we um and and so dr fabricius has been doing research in this field for like a decade right your and his research funded by the nih which is a very prestigious uh federal agency. So we're talking about solid research work here. Dr. Fabricius, why should we care about the emotional security of the child? How does that matter to the child? I know it's a well, stupid question, but let's No, it's the perfect sure. question to start with. Thank you. Right. Um, when children have good relationships with their parents, they develop a sense of emotional security. And that's really the foundation for them being able to achieve independence from their parents, to explore the social world, to explore the phys physical world, to go out into places like daycare, like school, the play groups, because they have this sense that if they feel threatened, the parents will be there. And you can see this in little babies, um, you know, one-year-olds or two-year-olds, when they're in a new situation, um, they, they, they can just turn their head just briefly and check, and mom and dad are there. Right, and uh, as they get older, it's it's the sense of emotional security that I, if I need to reach out to them, I'll have that support. So it's tremendously important. And when things go wrong in the parent-child relationship, or in the family relate the family relationships, children can develop a sense of insecurity, and that's basically worry that whether the parent will be there if I need them. And it's worry about whether my family will be able to work together for me. 
Um, it's worry about whether anyone will listen to me when I need it. And so that's all psychology. That's thoughts and worries and emotions. But what we've discovered um, you know, in, in recent modern times is that things are going on, as we call it, under the skin. And that means the child's physiological stress response system. And that's composed of very powerful hormones that uh, the brain releases when we are under threat and we have to fight or flee, basically. And, um, but if the child is just has a low grade sort of insecurity and worry about the responsiveness of the parents, that triggers that physiological stress system at a very low level but it releases chronic low doses of stress hormones through the child's system. And those, you know, those powerful hormones are designed to activate the body, put it in high gear. Um, and then the system is designed to soak up those hormones when the threat is passed. If the child is in a chronic low level stress state and worry about security, um, those hormones can interfere with normal bodily functions. It can interfere with growth, metabolism, interferes with the immune system, um, and makes the child more susceptible to uh, infectious diseases and um, makes it harder for that child to develop cognitively, to really think about things and to explore the world because of that worry. And we know from the public health literature that goes back to the 1960s that, um, you know, disturbed parent-child relationships and disturbed family relationships um, play out decades later into stress-related physical health problems in addition to mental health problems like depression, anxiety, and aggressiveness. So, yeah. So, I mean, um, uh, uh, from what I'm, I'm hearing here as well, I mean, I read your work as well, and you've done literature um, review where um, what you're saying now is that emotional security is not just this invisible thing that that we're talking about. It actually translate into physical condition in the child, in the child development, and the, ch the child will grow up with um, not just mental health, but physical health issues, right? Um, yes. Which is something that um, somehow um, it seemed like the system, the, you know, legislation or um, even the support system out there don't seem to recognize. Um, and that show how important it is your work your research into this because this bring impact into the child into it's not just a short term but the long term impact of it and i think you've done research or you've done review in i mean this is a multiple field that is intercepting right you're looking at the attachment theory you're looking at emotional security model you're looking at child development um impacts right you are smiling i'm, I'm not sure you're doing a better job than I could in explaining it. So it's yes, you're exactly right. I'm I'm happy to hear. Happy to hear you uh, summarize it. It's 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 right on. Yes. Thank you. So um, so let's talk about your research. Um, so you look at the parent-child relationship, and this was done over like a decade of work. Yeah, could you talk to us about that, please? Yes, so well, there's two sources. One is a decade long longitudinal study that was funded by the National Institutes of Health. And we uh, recruited families when children were 12 years old and followed them till they were 22. And um, we conducted, uh, you know, in depth uh, interviews with the mother, the father, and the child, um, professionally done, you know, high standards of reliability. And uh, so we can draw a lot of information from that data set about the role that the child's relationship with the mother and the father each play in long-term mental and physical health. Um, the other approach I've taken is to interview uh, college students 
about their experiences with their divorced family and also uh, interview the mothers and the fathers of those college students. So in that kind of study, we can look at 18 to 20 year olds and look back at what happened to them, uh, use their reports and their parents' reports. And in the first longitudinal study I told you about, we we're looking forward from age 12 up to 22. So we can look at it both ways and that's important to do because you want to, you want to see consistent results with different methods. And we find substantial consistency. Thank you. Um, and I see a question in the chat room, you guys. Thank you so much. Please let us know whatever questions that you have. We're going to try to pick it up. I saw Atlanta asking about where you can uh, find the study. We're going to post some information on that for you guys later. But yeah, please let us know whatever questions that you have. We're going to try to pick that up. Um, okay, so um, I think it's an, an important aspect about your study. Uh, it's so important to is to look uh, to to make sure that we are looking at causation. What is the difference between causation and correlation? You're smiling. <laughs> perfect question, just perfect. So the whole, the, 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 the question that's plagued research on parenting time after divorce has been exactly that. If you find that children with equal parenting time are doing better in terms of their health, is it because those families were special who decided to have equal parenting time. And uh, so maybe it's the parents themselves rather than the amount of parenting time. Mm -hmm. So if, it's, if children with equal parenting time are doing better in the long run, that's a correlation between the parenting time they have and their outcomes, and maybe that relationship is just due to the parents, not the time. If, on the other hand, parenting time does cause increases or decreases in parent-child relationships and the security of those, then, you know, then we know that parenting time is a, it has a causal impact, and then we should design policy to encourage it. So we have taken um, several different approaches to trying to find out whether parenting time causes better parent-child relationships or whether you know, it's just a reflection of them. And in general, this is a question that all of social science you know, faces. And um, you know, we face it very seriously. And we use the methods that have been develop to address the question. So um, I always like to draw the analogy with the early research that was done on tobacco smoking and the question of whether the smoking caused the cancer or whether it was something about the people who chose to smoke, right? Well, to just get to the bottom line, every way we've looked at the question of causality versus causation has consistently pointed to causality, and the, the role of parenting time in actually impacting the security of parent-child relationships. Um, I could. I don't know if you want me to go through all of the uh, ways we've we've done it, but I'll, I'll point out a couple of ways. And, and so the first one is. Hold on. Let, maybe just um, let me just um, make sure that it's um, clear for parents. So what we are talking about is, for example, uh, anytime it rain. Um, it happens that I, let's say, cook chicken. Uh, we wanted to know that is it the rain that caused me cook the chicken or it just incidentally that it's there's that relationship. And that is so important is because we need to be able to understand is it truly the parenting time that had the impact on the children or it just incidentally or maybe it's something else that causes coincident of this relationship. And so it's so important, it's Dr. Fabricius' work is truly determined that there's a causation relationship, meaning this caused that. Um, and, and so that's, that's the, the reason it's so important for us to see this. So uh, yeah, please do tell us, um, you said you were doing a few things, yes. Yes, so the, the question, you know, if the, the worry is that good parents choose to have equal parenting time, and that's why those children are doing better, right? 
Well, the first thing you have to realize is that parents really don't have as much choice over the parenting time arrangements they have, unlike the choice they have to smoke cigarettes or not. So we know that there are many cases where um, you know, fathers wanted more parenting time than they were granted. Um, we also know that the children of divorce express uh, wishes that they had more parenting time than they had. So for various reasons, um, mothers and fathers are not free in all cases to select the amount of parenting time. So there are very many good fathers, for example, and nowadays good mothers who have been denied equal parenting time for various reasons. So it's, it's not that easy to, to, you know, select the amount of parenting time you have. So that's just one, one way we look at it. Another way is that we see what's called a dose response relationship between parenting time and security of parent-child relationships. And that's a very important um, thing to find that that's what medical research often uses to establish the effectiveness of a drug or a treatment. So we, we see a very close relationship between step-by-step -step increases in the percentage of yearly parenting time and, and, re, and very closely related step-by-step -step increases in the security of the parent-child relationship so that we see the dose-response relationship. Um, we see the same relationship in low-conflict families as in high-conflict families, which is consistent with parenting time having a causal impact. We see the same relationship when we look at parenting time during infancy and toddlerhood. Um, so, so again, it, it's consistent with the parenting time having a long-term impact on the parent-child relationship. We see the same thing in cases where um, the parents relocate, move away after divorce, either the mother moving away with the child or the father moving away without the child, we see the same negative impacts of the decreased parenting time after relocation and decreased security of parent-child relationships. And finally, we have um, a study that um, is being written up right now, which uses the most state-of-the-art methods of separating causality from causation. Uh, these are methods that um, statisticians have just developed in the last about 10 years. And uh, we have been able to use those methods on our 10-year longitudinal data. And the results are very clear that if parenting time goes up or down in one, one year, it could go up for various reasons, it could go down for relocation or jobs, whatever. But uh, from the ages of 12 to 22, if parenting time increases uh, in one year, about a year and a half later, you see stronger father-child relationships. And if parenting time with the father goes down in one year, again, one to two years later, we see a decrease in the parent-child relationships. So it's very, I, you know, I'm a careful researcher and I, try to make as, be, to be as, as confident as I can in what I'm testing. And uh, I'm, I'm convinced, given the whole pattern of evidence that, that parenting time does impact the security of not only the father-child relationship, but the mother-child relationship. And um, so what you are um, proposing is essentially equal shared parenting right um does that so when you like when let's say one parent doesn't get a lot of time and now you advocate for that parent to get more parenting time so that it's equal does that impact the relationship of the other parent with the child mm -hmm. no no equal parenting time is related to the best mother child relationships and father-child relationships on a comparable level to what we see in families that are not divorced. So as parenting time with the father increases from 0% to 50%, 
we see a, a strengthening of the father-child relationship and no harm to the mother-child relationship. And the same thing is true vice versa. So yeah. if the child is having, um, you know, 0% time with mom up to 50% time with mom, we see a strengthening of the mother-child relationship and no decrease in the father-child relationship. And this is why it's so important um, for the system, for the legislators to see this, to understand this, for judges to understand this, to advocate for this, and professionals out there, lawyers, therapists, and for you as parents, it's so, also important to stay in the fight to get your parenting time, because this is such an important factor in the emotional security of your child. Um, and what I, I really appreciate and have so much respect for Dr. Fabricius is that not only he's doing research, but he's also a very strong advocate um, in the legislation arena. Uh, could you please talk to us a little bit about the work that you have done and actually the outcome that you have, have been able to bring for parents, especially in Arizona, right? Yes, um, let me just start by saying I don't consider myself an advocate in the way that term is often used. I consider myself an educator, first a researcher, and then an educator in the sense of making people aware of the research. So when I started doing this research, it was really 20 years ago. And um, we had a, a mechanism in the Arizona legislature and courts um, to it was a large committee that was designed to provide feedback on family law legislation. So I was a member of that committee uh, on a volunteer basis. And um, as I did the research on parenting time, I would present it to the committee. So we were learning together. And initially there was a lot of skepticism about equal parenting time. But as the data came in, especially the judges listened to it and um, were convinced. So by about 2008 to 2010, um, I knew that the family law judges in Arizona were, were seeing the benefits of equal parenting time. And many of them on their own were starting to you know, encourage parents to do that. Um, and so at that point, we, uh, I felt confident enough in the pattern of the research to form a subcommittee uh, to reform the entire uh, Arizona child custody statutes. And we looked at all aspects of it and we had everybody um, at the table who had something to contribute. And it resulted in um, really the first uh, child custody statute that um, basically presumed equal parenting time unless there were strong arguments against it. And that went into law January 1st, 2013. Uh, we've since done an evaluation of the law by, um, by surveying the entire family law community in Arizona, judges, attorneys, mental health professionals, and the directors of the conciliation, directors and staff of the county conciliation courts, which you know see most of the divorcing uh, parents, and the law is is seen as positive by all groups, and there's been no attempt to modify or change it since 2013. And when I send visitors from different countries and and um, different states to to talk to members of the Arizona family law community, they come back and say, they're not only happy with it, but they're proud of it. So we now know that it actually does work. <laughs> um, That's wonderful. So it's quite satisfying, actually. That is so wonderful. And this is uh, actually so important for parents. I, I wanted to point out, well, if you listen to what Dr. Fabricia just shared with us, it's so important for us to recognize that um, and, and I see, I understand, and I see when parents get so frustrated with the system because, you know, there's this lack of awareness at all levels. Um, but 
and we we want to change the system but you look at how much work that was put in like dr fabricia is talking about sharing the information over like nearly a decade of work um and so it's about changing the system is you have to be patient you have to build relationship and he talked about everyone sitting at the table you have to bring everyone to the table you not only we need data and information but we need to help raising the awareness we need to bring everyone to the table and be patient so we are working to change the system and and i do understand you feeling frustrated but really we do have to be patient we can make the change because if you get frustrated now and giving up we're not going to be able to make that change so you know listen to this story it's so inspiring and really truly understand that it does take a lot of work the system is a big slow moving machine so you know to make change we do have to take time um the other aspect of your research um we're talking about the emotional security model um one of the factors you talk about is parenting time which we now see so important what is the other factor i know there's another factor in that model when it comes to the parent child emotional security mm -hmm. yeah that other factor is parent conflict yeah and both are important um we always look at both in our research and you have to address both of those in any proposed legislative reforms right? so Minimal parenting time is harmful to the child's relationship with the parent that they're not seeing very often. By the same token, parent conflict is harmful to the child when they are exposed to it. And both of those things work through the same emotional security system. Right? So one's not more important than the other. And we know from lots of research that's gone on for years, and research into parent conflict, we really understand that when the parents are fighting, it causes a certain particular type of emotional insecurity in the child. And that's worry that I'll be abandoned and that I won't be listened to. And also that I might be hurt or one of my parents might be hurt. And we have ways of measuring that specific type of worry and emotional insecurity. By the same token, or, or but parenting time spent with, with, with the child, parenting time affects a different sort of side of emotional security. And that's the child's either security or worry that they um, are important to that parent or that they matter to that parent. So especially for younger children, if there's a divorce or separation and the child is suddenly now seeing one parent a lot less, the only way children have to understand that is that that parent doesn't want to see me. And that causes the worry that whether I'm important or whether I can count on that parent. So um, what we find is that both minimal parenting time and high levels of parent conflict lead to particular types of emotional insecurity. And both of those types of emotional insecurity impact the child's later health. So the message that has to be given to courts and legislators is that um, what you've been doing so far in trying to protect children from exposure to parent conflict is good and noble and well-intentioned. But to, to try to protect children from exposure to parent conflict by reducing the child's parenting time with one of the parents, that's a very blunt instrument. And that actually exposes the child to an additional type of emotional insecurity. So what you wanna do, I think, as courts and, and legislators is to you know, find ways to reduce the parent conflict while maintaining equal parenting time. Parent conflict naturally decreases after divorce. Every time anybody's ever looked at it, three, four, five years after the divorce, the level of conflict has gone down. Um, in some cases, of course, it doesn't. But um, the courts have better ways of addressing parent conflict than by sort of removing one parent from the child's life. Uh, and I think it's just very important to make the, uh, to educate, you know, people that, um, you know, 
both of these things work through the child's emotional insecurity and both play out in physical health problems later on, which means that this is a public health issue that has you know, um, consequences for individuals' happiness and pain and suffering, but also for society's you know, cost of public health um, issues. So it's a, I think it's a very coherent, very strong argument, but uh, you have to help people understand how these systems work. Uh, and especially how the child can misinterpret, you know, standard every other weekend visitation, the child is left worrying about whether that parent really wants to see me and whether they will come back. And it's especially, that's especially happens the younger the child is. Yeah, this is definitely a very big public health problem because the problem is widespread and it has serious consequences. And like you said, the impact is on the in individuals. It's impacting society. There's a society cost in, in public health, but also the ability of contribution, this massive number of individuals can contribute to society later on in life as well. So really it's, it's a huge public health problem, but yet there's not enough recognition and and that's why it's so important. Your work is so important. But for parents, um, I wanted to kind of reemphasize what Dr. Fabricius has just been covered, um, at least a few things that he covered, which is um, talking about the mattering issue. You know, it's so important for your child to understand that that they matter to you. So as, as parents, that's a very important aspect of this is with the time that you fighting for your parenting time and with the time that you have ensuring that the child understand that the child matter to you because that's the important aspect here of the model that he found um is, is that right dr fabricius uh, yes yes i think i think now with what we understand parents can legitimately request equal parenting time in in all of these cases and be putting that before courts with the evidence behind it. Um, it's especially important in high conflict families. This is very counterintuitive. The courts and mental health professionals have been thinking for years that if there's higher conflict, then there should be less shared parenting. But the research shows exactly the opposite. Uh, even in high conflict families, more parenting time with dad, and that's those are the large, we really can't measure, you know, father custody families and parenting time with mom because there just aren't enough people that we can, you know, um, reliably obsess with, with our statistics. So we always look at the father, the father uh, parenting time. So, to, sorry, to go back, even in a high conflict family, more parenting time with father uh, is related to stronger father-child relationships. And it's also related to less insecurity about the conflict itself. This is a finding that uh, several people have found. And what we think is happening there is that if the parents are engaged in you know, a lot of conflict around the time of the divorce and for a little while after it, the child, if the child has two homes, equal parenting time, that in itself is a source of security that the conflict is not going to drive one of them away because both of them are here. They're both providing a home for me. They're fighting, but children worry less about the conflict uh, in equal parenting time arrangements. So we see we see lots of reasons why parents should be making the case for equal parenting time. Of course, you have to live close. <laughs> you can't have equal parenting time if you're living far away from the child. So there are accommodations that need to be made in terms of um, parents' lives after the divorce. Um, and especially with fathers who move away from their children. Uh, they shouldn't do that, <laughs> guys. Come on. Yeah, and, and I wanted to point out, even though uh, Dr. Fabricius will sort of focus more on the father, but we are not trying to say, um, we're not trying to 
be any way in any way sort of biased in terms of gender. This issue applies to both uh, mothers and fathers, and really, it's 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 there's no there's no difference. Um, it can happen to both father and mothers. We see that in real life. We see that in legal system. Um, so anyway, um, the other aspect that he also mentioned, which is so important, is how parental conflicts have the impact on the child emotional security. So as parents, it's so important for you to recognize this and to shelter the best you can the child from that conflict. Because sometimes parents, um, you may not, and it's a natural reaction, you may not be aware of this. So you sometimes keeping inadvertently keeping the child in the middle of the conflict by saying, oh, your father, why would he say this? And why your mother, why did you, you know, don't do that. So be aware that this the parental conflict has this impact on your child and try your best. Um, maybe the other party doesn't, but when you can, you yourself have to try to shelter your child from that conflict. Um, and then could you talk about um, the parent responsiveness, which is also another factor here and what that is about? Parent responsiveness to the, <clears throat> the child's wants and needs is a very important you know, component of that child developing security in that relationship. Right? Uh, we've known that for a long time. That's what researchers look at in terms of parents and infants. Um, is the parent responding to the infant signals? Right? We can all imagine, I always tell my class that the best, you know, sort of one of the great Examples of that is diaper changing. Diaper changing is an incredible opportunity to, to be responsive to your child, right? But it's also, you know, it can be a time when the parent decides that I'm going to do this on my schedule and uh, because, you know, it's not very fun for me and the child might want to play, the child might be, you know, sleepy or whatever. But, um, you know, it's, it, 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 when you think about diaper change, you can think either the parent goes in doing it on their schedule regardless of signals from the infant, or you can respond to those signals and, and they can be different each time. So responsiveness is, is one of the things that builds up emotional security in the child. We have actually interviewed 400 adolescents um, starting at age 12, and we interviewed them again at age uh, 15, uh, uh, 14 and a half. And we asked the adolescents to just talk about their relationship with mom and the relationship with dad. Uh, in some cases, they had a stepdad. So we asked about that. Um, and in what they said, there was a, so much consistency in what they said. They talked essentially about three things in each of these relationships. One was how responsive their parent was to their wants and needs. Um, things like when I need help with homework, and, you know, do they help me? Or when I you know, want something. Um, but a second one was, was just the, the sort of emotional um, quality of the relationship. So whether there's warmth and love and humor versus anger and, you know, short-tempered and coldness. But the third one, which we were very surprised about, especially the surprise that adolescents would talk about this, was how much time their parents spent with them. You know, they would say things like, well, you know, I hardly ever see her, or he does a lot with us. And so they were talking about three aspects of parent-child relationships that go all the way back to infancy how responsive the parent is, how warm and close uh, and happy the relationship is, and the time spent together. So this is one of the things that convinced us of the importance of time together, because even adolescents are evaluating that. Um, and that, what that means to them is, do I matter to this parent, right? And, um, so all three of those things are important. And of course, the, you know, the time spent together is what translates into 
um, custody policy, something that policymakers can have some impact on um, to avoid doing harm. So Dr. Fabricius, just talk about um, parent responsiveness. So what it is, is about um, responding to your child when your child is happy or sad that you have the appropriate response. So the child feels like you are, that they matter to you, mm -hmm. that, that you care, that you, um, so for parents uh, having the parenting time, this is so important because when you do have your child, you want it to be there for them instead of being on your phone, being, you know, a lot of the time you don't appreciate and you don't take advantage of the time that you do have. And especially today, the modern society, we have so many distractions in our life. And so it's so important for you to recognize the responsiveness, the factor on your child, your and your child's relationship is when you do have time with your child, make sure that it's quality time, focusing on um, improving this quality time by, you know, eye contact, physical contact, uh, um, uh, you know, by using words that are, you know, um, supportive, that are loving, uh, you know, things like that, you know, having hugs, um, bonding activities, things like that. Make sure that you're improving your parent responsiveness so that you can improve the quality of your time with your children. Now, a lot of you don't have contact with your children, like you don't have the parenting time with your children, then make sure you're trying to improve your best, the responsiveness, maybe through text messages, through other ways of social media contact in a way that you can somehow improve this responsiveness the best you can. I know it's challenging when you don't have the parenting time. So we talk, um, Dr. Fabricius, we talk about uh, parenting time being a huge factor here. Uh, we talk about the parent responsiveness being also a very important factor. We talk about um, parent uh, conflict being a huge factor um, in, in the in the child emotional uh, security model and how that impact the child's well being and health and well being later on in life um, and the child development even at younger age. Um, could you talk a little bit about domestic violence? Yes, we have uh, looked at that recently. And what we find is pretty much the same pattern that we find when we just uh, ask about parent conflict that not necessarily violent. But we get um, mothers and fathers to report on the incidences of, of domestic violence that happened in the past. And what we see is that um, just like for parent conflict, that it has a harmful effect on the child's emotional security, um, and it tends to increase uh, the, the child's emotional insecurity about having witnessed domestic violence tends to increase as parenting time increases up to about 30 or 35 percent. But then what we see is the same thing, that at equal parenting time, the child is showing less insecurity about the amount, about the parent, about, about the domestic violence that they witnessed. So we think that, you know, witnessing domestic violence has the same kind of impact on the child's in, emotional insecurity as, you know, being exposed to nonviolent parent conflict. And Kind of surprisingly, in both cases, it seems like equal parenting time is a way to buffer the child's insecurity about parents who've been in conflict or have had some instances of, of domestic violence in the past. Now, of course, when we look at domestic violence in our big uh, longitudinal uh, data set, um, there are, of course, some cases, a few cases with really extreme levels of violence. So I really can't talk about you know, what level of domestic violence that is, uh, you know, a game changer. But um, we look at cases where there have, where the child reports there and the parents report, there have been some instances of it, either perpetrated by the mother or by the father. And um, we again see beneficial effects associated with equal parenting time, even in those families that had a history of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. So what what you're saying is that unless it's a situation of extreme 
domestic violence that put the child at risk. If there was domestic violence in the situation, you see similar correlation in terms of the improving emotional security uh, on the child um, when it talk when we're talking about parenting time, both for uh, the presence of some domestic violence and no domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, especially with equal parenting time. I, we don't know exactly what, you know, what that means to the child, but you, you can imagine that um, probably the child gets the message that even if mom or dad had been instigating some domestic violence in the past, that, you know, they're still a good parent because I'm with them half the time. Um, children read so much into the time that they have with the parent um, that we just keep seeing benefits associated with equal parenting time. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, actually, uh, yeah, before I go into the question and parents, like I said, make sure you post your questions. Um, Dr. Fabricio does have to leave soon, so we can't have a very long interview. So if you have a question, please post it now. I'm going to try to pick the question. Um, are there any other things that I should have asked you? You know, anything else about the, the model, any other things that you think is really important well, to highlight here? I guess about um, parenting time during infancy and toddlerhood. That is a huge question. Um, and um, I have been involved with the debates at policy levels about it and the research on it. Um, I've just finished writing a, a, a chapter um, for an Oxford handbook of, of family and child law um, about parenting time during infancy and toddlerhood. And we have done a study uh, on that and um, it is a very good study. Um, I can say that because my part of my job is evaluating research and reviewing re research for, for you know, journals. Um, and Basically, what we find is that the parent, the amount of overnight parenting time that the child had during the first year from birth to one year of age, and also from one to two, and then two to three, um, has a, 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 a strong connection with long-term parent-child relationships, even when you control for the amount of parenting time they had in childhood and, and adolescence. So it, it seems to be especially important to have equal overnight parenting time during their child's earliest years, uh, because that's when the attachments form. That's when parents learn how to be a parent to that child. That's when parents learn about this child as an individual. And we see that, um, we see the effect, the, 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 the impact of those, of the, a, a number of overnights during the first three years um, over and above uh, the parenting time they had later. And again, um, the benefits of equal parenting time were uh, the same in high conflict families and low conflict families more educated parents versus less educated parents. Uh, and the most important thing was that we were able to ask the parents, did you choose to have equal numbers of overnights during the first child, the child's first few years, or did the court impose it in one way or the other? And we find the benefits even when the court imposed more overnight parenting time over the mother's objections. Uh, and other studies have found that too, that when parents do go to court and the court does impose more parenting time than they would have, you see benefits to the child. Um, typically, parents who do go to court are more likely to get more parenting time. Um, and you know, when the courts impose it, we see the benefits. So it, that's another piece of evidence that it's not just the good parents selecting to have more parenting time. 
Um, th this is why it's so important, um, and we say this a lot to parents, especially when you have younger children, it's so important for you to not give up the fight. It's so important to be there for your children. And, and a lot of the time, sometimes parents think, well, they're too young, uh, you know, maybe it doesn't matter, I'll wait until they grow up a bit bigger and then they will understand and I'll rebuild that relationship. But this is why it's so important to recognize the early childhood experience, how that impacts your relationship and how it impacts your child well-being um, later on in life. This has a very long-term impact. Um, I thought it was another interesting thing was that you proposed something about, uh, because uh, especially in terms of a high conflict situation, um, how do you, um, there's a proposal that you put about how do you minimize this uh, conflict impact and still ensuring parenting time? I'm not sure if if I'm making sense here. Do you want to talk about that? Well, I know in Arizona and, and in other states, uh, parents can be required to go to uh, parent education classes uh, or to mediation or to um, having something like a parent coordinator, various ways that the message can get to parents that you need to stop fighting up between each other, lower the conflict because that's going to be better for your child and better for your long-term relationship with your child. So I think the kinds of things that, that you were saying before about being aware of when you're in conflict and, and um, being aware that the child is listening, um, be aware of the things you say. Um, and I think that parents need to be educated and in cases get therapy and get help for how to reduce that. It's very yeah. important. Right, so for parents being well-informed, well-educated, so important. And that is why it's so good that you guys are here watching because you you are one of those parents that really can, you wanted to learn, you wanna be better parents and you're not giving up hope. And that's so important. And I really admire you guys for being here. Um, and the other things that I think you, you talk about in some of your papers is that when there's a lot of conflict and you wanted to ensure, you wanted to minimize the parental conflict um, is by minim minimizing that chance of interaction. So you could structure the parenting time while you're still ensuring equal shared parenting time is by having sort of a longer block of times, right? So reducing the number of exchange. So instead of having exchanging every day or something, then it increasing the interaction of the parents. You may try to still ensuring equal par parenting time, uh, but minimizing parenting interaction by having just block of that, right? Yeah, that's a very good strategy. Yes. Um, Thank you. But also being careful of what you say when the child is with you. As you said before, little comments that denigrate the other parent are harmful to the child. So right. get over your own hurt and pain and realize your child is feeling equal, if not more hurt and pain and put the child first. Right. Yeah, it, that's the thing about parental alienation. It's the children that are the true victims. You feel mm -hmm. really hurt, you're really in pain, but your children are the true victims here. Um, I'm gonna try to go through the, the comments uh, and questions and see what we can get. I know that some of the questions and comments I can't get to, but okay, uh, Alicia said they hear and feel everything. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Claudia said, I've had to relearn their love language by discovering their interests. Um, yeah, this is the thing. When you have a um, good access to your children, you know, when you, before you're divorced, sometimes parents will uh, take things for granted. You you may not pay attention to your children. You may not, you know, you, you just kind of like, you love your children the way you love your children instead of loving your children the way that your children need to be loved. Um, so I think this is so important. Do you want to comment? I saw you smile. So I'm... you express it so well. It's, uh, I'm learning from you. Um, <laughs> You're that's, too that's nice. very, very, very well put and very true. Thank you. You're too nice. Thank you. The divorce um... and separation can like, I think, you know, it can be an opportunity to have a better relationship with your child and an independent relationship with your child. Um, you know, in some ways, children can get to know their mothers and fathers better as individuals when they have separate homes than when they were together. Um, I'm not advocating divorce, but look for opportunities and uh, 
Yeah, always be thinking about your child. Right. Um, Noel, agree with Alicia that yes, the children do uh, hear and feel everything. Sabrina said, so to sum it up, the child needs both parents who are grown up enough to put their child first. Yeah, that's a good sum up, Sabrina. Um, someone said, oh, it scrolled so fast. Oh, this comment, I'm sorry, I missed some. Uh, someone said, um, this is an op opportunity to go deeper and do better. Yes, so this is a silver lining in the divorce, um, mm -hmm. is this is your opportunity to reevaluate and relearn your skill as parents and and go deeper and things will never go back to the, the way they were, but they, it can be a lot better. And it's up to you to do this now. Um, okay. I, I'm trying to figure out how I can see the comment. This is so frustrating. I, I, I apologize. How do I scroll? This, this, I know there's so many comments and yet I can't scroll it. I'm sorry. Um, Do we have any fathers there? There's a lot of fathers. Are there are there fathers in the room? I, I know we have mm -hmm. a lot of fathers in in the in the comments. Um, yeah, can you tell us a little bit why is your research focused on on father instead of mothers? I mean, well, other than the fact that you you're probably working on yourself, uh, your personal interest. No, no, we 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 measure the father child relationship and the mother child relationship always. But when we talk about parenting time, there's just not enough cases where the father has the primary home and the mother has less visiting time. So there's just smaller numbers. And so you really can't draw very strong conclusions. But when we do look at it, we see exactly the same processes happening. And yes. I know I, I testify uh, occasionally in, in um, you know, in, in court cases. And, um, you know, I've had cases where the mother is trying to get equal parenting time uh, because the father has um, been able to deny her time. And, you know, it's the same, it's the same thing that I say in both cases. And um, it really is clear though, that the courts, you know, can make it difficult for mothers to get equal parenting time if the father is able to, you know, do certain things. Right, um, right. Yeah. Do you have any advice? I see that uh, a few things in, and, and yeah, I definitely see father like Paul in the chat room said, yes, I'm here, I'm a father. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, do you have advice for parents that have to deal with false allegation? Because, you know, false for, for, for allegation of abuse is a pretty effective tool or well, when it comes to parental alienation. Um. I know, I think that the really the only way to deal with that is to um, have legislative change um, that recognizes that parenting time is just as important to, to as dealing with parent conflict or allegations of, you know, abuse or child neglect or, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, the court should, court should look into those separately, but in the meantime, don't deal with them by removing one parent. Um, I know in Arizona, when we were revising our statutes, we put in sanctions both for false allegations and false denials. And that sends a message, I think, to, to both parents that you need to be truthful about this. Um, we haven't seen any uh, sort of large increase in allegations of monster abuse. We've seen a small, a small uptick, um, which the, the you know, which actually kind of indicates that a law presuming equal parenting time doesn't stifle allegations. Um, so it looks like parents aren't afraid to bring them or, or th that they feel that they won't be listened to. So we don't, we neither see a, a decrease in them after the law was passed or, you know, there's a slight increase, but not a substantial one. Um, there's a question in the chat room about how, how can, is there a way for parents uh, to sign up to be a part of your study? 
Uh, no, uh, unfortunately. Um, uh, okay, we might, I... actually, we might in the future, I'm talking with people in the Nordic countries, in Denmark and Norway, about uh, replicating some of our findings there. And we might do that over the, um, you know, over uh, social media. There are various platforms where people can volunteer for research there, but we don't know for sure. But, um... Thank you. Um... Tyler asks, how do you de-escalate the child's anger and hatred? Well, um, got to find out what's causing it, I suppose. Is the child mad at you? Um, ask the child to talk. You know, if the child's angry, um, talk. Listen. Don't be defensive. Anger is a, is, a, is a plea for communication. Yeah, don't take the bait. Don't react to, um, that's the thing, when it comes to parental alienation, the, the, the other parent had portrayed you as this dangerous, unsafe, uh, unloving, not available parent. So when you, when you are truly a loving parent, you want this good relationship with your child, don't take the bait when your child acts this way because your child has been programmed and brainwashed in acting this way. So really don't, don't react to your child behavior with defensiveness and aggression and things like that because then you're going to confirm the alienator's false narrative. Really, it's really important to take yourself out of that and then from there, rebuild that relationship with your children. Um, we'll, we'll have a lot of this conversation in other interviews as well, especially with the interview with um, Dr. Amy Baker. So check out our videos that we, when we interview her. Um, okay. Um, Nigel said professionals appointed from the court uh, for example, guardians at litem should be determining the cause of this. What is the cause of, of what? Are you talking about domestic violence, I, I assume? Um, and yes, if that's the case, there's, um, I think that's, a, that's a, a very huge topic and I wanted to explore this because it's such a false allegation of abuse. It's such an effective tool, unfortunately, for alienators to take the children away from parents. Um, and I really want to explore how do you fight false allegation and in a separate conversation later. Um, I know the time is up, is, is running out, so we're going to have to go. But um, do you have any last thoughts of, of wisdom for parents? Any Anything else that, that we should add before you go? I, I know I can't hold you <laughs> too long. No, no, not, not at all. Um, I, uh, I think we've, we've pretty much covered um, what I've been able to learn about this, uh, I think you're doing a great job with practical strategies for parents who are caught in these situations. Um, I've, I've enjoyed hearing you talk about talk about that. Um, I, I think that parents can be can be reassured that they should ask for equal parenting time, and they should try to educate the courts and the policymakers. I know in Arizona. Um, you know, I talked about the committee that we had formed, and I talked about me presenting the research as it as it was developing. But the other side of that was a dad. Um, his name was Mike Espinoza, and he went to his state senator with his story of how he was being cut out of his children's lives, and he was able to get her ear, and um, she was determined to. Uh, drop a bill uh, that would presume joint legal custody. And so his story and his uh, relationship with the state senator was, was a real motivating force behind my committee, you know, getting into high gear and um, getting language together and coming, coming to, a, to a, a, a comprehensive bill. So, you know, it's both things. It's talking, uh, going to your going to your state legislators, um, try, to, try to find someone in your, you know, in, in your local university who's a child developmental psychologist or a family psychologist. Uh, they know 
my field knows that fathers are important and just as important as mother-child relationships, but very few of us go out into the real world and um, try to educate, you know, family law communities, but approach, you know, approach people in, in your locale who can do that, who can, you know, be available for questions and advice and go and talk to legislators and talk to committee hearings. Um, we're putting, you know, we just started now to put all of this research and all of these findings together into, into a book that could basically be a handbook for, um, you know, the, the, the importance of equal parenting time in relation to parent conflict and, um, you know, the various research on different aspects of it, like relocation and time with infants and toddlers. Uh, so just be encouraged that the, the research is there. Um, and it basically, we also know that the public opinion is behind it. That was the other thing we didn't talk about. Uh, we did large public opinion studies in Arizona and found that this is the issue that crosses all lines. Democrat, Republican, male, female, divorced, intact, high income, low income. We found no factor that differentiated people in their agreement that children should have equal time with both parents after divorce. So the culture is there. Um, and the research is there. And it all is completely intuitive and is what we all know already. So be brave. So what, what, what else is still the question? What is the next big question in your mind about? Any well, it's how to change the policy. And as you said in the beginning, policy is hard to change because, you know, people aren't aware of all the facts. Some of the, some of the information is new. They haven't gone to graduate school or law school for decades. They don't know the modern statistics. Um, and what they've been doing in the past is it's hard to change because you have to admit that maybe what you were doing in the past wasn't the best. So you have to not threaten people. You have to get people on board. The one thing we did in, in Arizona was we agreed to modernize both the parenting time language and the, the uh, domestic violence language in the bill. And so that was one way we got everybody together because you know, the domestic violence language in this child custody statute needed to be modernized um, away from just physical violence towards more emotional and controlling kinds of, kinds of violence. So um, build bridges, realize that it's the child and all of these things are happening through the child's physiological system. Uh, that really makes it clear that what's in the best interest of the child is, you know, having this sense of emotional security for their long-term health. And, uh, you know, you're right in wanting equal parenting time. So be brave in asking for it, sure. Thank you so much. I know you have to go. Uh, I, I'm so grateful for this conversation. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Um, I know Dr. Fabricius has to go. I'm gonna stay on a little bit and see if I can catch um, uh, you know some of your questions um the best i can and then for any questions that are sort of critical maybe we can send it to dr fabricius to get his comment later on but thank you so much for being here thank you Petru. thank you um and parents so he yeah and yeah you go ahead you you, you can leave i know you have the next meeting um i'm just gonna stay on and make sure that i i see if i can catch uh, more question with parents right. yeah, thank you bye-bye Bye bye. Yeah. Um, so parents. Um, okay. So Dr. Fabricius talked a, a, quite a bit about uh, legislation um, and advocating for change. So this week or maybe early next week, we need to pick a time, but we're going to have a Zoom call to talk to parents about how you can change the legislation, how you can participate in this. Um, we wanted to share with you guys, this is going to be a private Zoom conversation. It's not going to be a live stream event. Um, because we wanted this to be a discussion. We want you to be on at the table and bring your question and your ideas 
um, but we wanted to share and we're going to bring some advocates with us to share what they have done, their experiences in how to change the law in their state. So if you are interested in this, make sure you join our mailing list uh, on victimtohero.com website because we're going to send out uh, an email just to invite you to join the, the Zoom call. We're going to, like I said, it's going to be sometimes this week or early next week. Now, I'm going to try my best to look at the questions that you have and see if I can answer any of those or um, if there's something critical I'm going to send to Dr. Fabricius to see um, to get his comments on it. And thank you so much, you guys, for being here. Really appreciate you. Really appreciate your support as always. Um, OK, so um, let's see the, the questions that I can see. Um, OK, Crystal said fathers are getting more time. Um, it's starting to turn around now. The father took my time. Um, yeah, Crystal, I, I agree. I think traditionally the system have been biased. There's a gender bias in the system. So usually uh, mothers sort of almost automatically get more time, but things are changing now. So that's why we, we've been saying this is a, not a gender issue. It happens to both mothers and fathers and yeah, a lot of the time mothers lose the parenting time and for the wrong reason. We have a lot of cases of false allegations. We've seen it. Uh, I am a mother and it happened to me and I had to fight that. So it, it, it can happen to both genders. We're not trying to be gender biased in any way. Um, Noelle said, thank you. Thank you so much, Noelle, for, for being here, for your support. I've seen you at multiple of our events. Really appreciate that. And thank you, parents. Please, if any of this resonates with you, please like the video. Please help sharing it so that more people can see this. Um, you know, Facebook has this algorithm that, you know, the more interaction we have, it will help bringing this more exposure. Um, we're also going to upload this video to YouTube. So, you know, if you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can search for it. It's under Victim to Hero. Thank you. Um, okay. Nigel said, I know false allegation can ruin your health as, as well as your child's life. False allegation can destroy lives. It can literally destroy lives. We've seen parents that, that kill themselves. We've seen parents that got killed because of false allegation. It, it get to the extreme. We've seen children that getting killed because of false allegation. Um, and and we've seen everything in between, you know, the impact of false allegation on the situation. And and this is so this is the thing. It bothered me a lot, and I've been thinking a lot because this is such an effective tool for, for alienators. So I think a very important aspect of, of this is for us to figure out how do we fight false allegation so here's my ask for you guys now if any of you have successfully fought false allegation in court could you please reach out to me because i want to talk to you and i want to hear how you fight it if you know of lawyers who are really good at fighting false allegation in court could you please let me know as well you can message us on victim to hero facebook page and um yeah let let me know if you did not fight you, you were not successful in for fighting for false allegation, but yet you have clear and convincing evidence of false allegation, could you please also let me know. So I'm really the next thing I really wanted to kind of take a look at is how do we fight false allegation because this has always been the situation. And um, I see that as such a such a big roadblock because as soon as there's false allegation of abuse it take everybody back because then suddenly you know teachers uh therapists lawyer judges everyone suddenly kind of step back and go well you know um we don't know if this is true or false but we're going to be trying to um be safe we're going to play safe by just taking the child away from that parent that was being accused uh, and suddenly now nobody is really paying attention to everything else that we're talking about today you know the child emotional security and and all that and so now suddenly instead of what it should be the case which is until proven uh you're, you're not guilty until proven and yet now when in case of false allegation it becomes that you are guilty until you can prove that you are not guilty and and that's the system is like upside down in that way and and that really bothered me, so we definitely have to to think about this. 
Um, okay, Sabrina said, I have overcome vicious, awful false allegation, which lead me to almost dying of heart failure. I'm happy to share. Sabrina, please reach out to me. I want to talk to you. Thank you so much. Um, we got Tyler said, I've been out of courts for over 11 years. Um, and we will see going forward, who knows, but I hope I don't have to go back to court. Courts is such a painful experience and a lot of parents have to go in and out of courts for, and it get dragged out for, for many, many years and it drain you financially, it drain you emotionally, it drain you physically, it destroy your relationship with your children, it destroy your relationship with yourself, it destroy your relationship with other people. It's, it's a horrible situation to be in. Um, Let's see, what else do I have? Uh, Claudia said, Google, who represents me? Okay, so um, this is talking about uh, legislation. If you wanted to participate, if you wanted to make your voice heard, um, politicians are there to represent you. So you, um, and, and they do want to hear from the constituents. They wanted to make sure that the con constituents are happy. So you can make your voice heard by reaching out to the to the politicians who represent you. So everyone, doesn't matter where you are, there are politicians that represent you. So you can Google who represents me. And in the, in the US, for every state, you should have your um, house representative you should have your state senators that represent your district based on where you are and you should have someone in the congress level that represent you and you should be able to find that information and then they will always have some way for you to reach out to them so contact them share your story try to be less drama and focusing on what matters because you want to hear your make you want your stories to be heard you want them to see that is not you that is the problem they you want them to see the the problem in itself uh, of whatever the situation is but yeah do reach out and speak to people but anyway like i said we're going to have a zoom call coming up um either the, later this week or early next week to talk specifically about this how can you um participate in reshaping the system we need to change the law. We need the politicians to hear us. We need to the legislators, the policy makers to hear and see the, the problem. Um, Hatcher said the system is built upon division. Majority are only now seeing it as it's being done to everyone uh, of current, I feel. Um, yeah, awareness, public awareness takes time. Uh, change the system change takes time. And sometimes it seems so frustrating because you don't see the change, but slowly it does change. And, and it's important for us to not give up. Crystal says, sign me up, please. Uh, yeah, Crystal, please go to our website, victimtohero.com, and you can sign up to our mailing list. I think it's at the uh, top right of the website. You can sign up to our mailing list, and then that way you can get our emails. I know we don't. We don't send out a lot of emails, which is a good thing. You're, you're not going to be spam. We, we're not going to sell your information. We're not going to spam you. Um, we actually don't send enough emails, which I'm going to try to change that. But um, we're going to send out information on how you can join the Zoom call, because that way we want you to participate in that conversation. We're going to talk about how we can change the system. Uh, Paul said defamation is a criminal offense in Greece. Well. Uh, in the US, um, uh, what is the term? Um, well, defamation is something that you can fight um, as well as, um, I'm going blank right now, when you can prove that the, the other person um, lie in order to benefit. What is the term for that? Um, I'm sorry, I'm, go I, I, I'm, I'm going blank right now. I'm, I'm a little bit tired today. But um, there's a term for it. It's a criminal offense. So if you, if you can prove that the other person falsely accuse you uh, in order to benefit. And when it's a criminal offense, it's something that you don't have to find. 
against them in the civil, you can, if you want to, you can go through the civil route, which is suing them for damages. But you can also get the district attorney office to fight for you because it's a criminal matter. So it, it's up to the state, to, to the government, the state and the federal government to fight for you as a victim. Uh, I'll, I'll figure out that word later. I'm sorry, I just can't think of it right now. Um, Tia said, thank you for organizing. I have lost parenting time for treating my children with holistic medicine. Uh, yeah, this is the thing, right? Um, when you're in the good relationship with the alienators, you know, when you're still married, right? The alienator marry you or, or have a relationship with you uh, for who you are, supposedly, right? So when, like, if you didn't break up, then it's fine. Like whatever you do is fine. Like you, the holistic treatment, know that was considered okay, or sometimes even considered a good thing. And then suddenly, when it comes to a custody battle, suddenly everything about you is being used against you, and suddenly now it's being seen as a bad thing, and um, and it's, it's just terrible. Um, so she said, my shared parenting contracts say although there is no evidence of abuse or neglect. Circumstances have changed since the divorce. I don't know how to get 50-50 back after that. I don't understand why they were able to remove my kids from 50-50 without any abuse or neglect. Um, yeah, so I don't understand your case uh, specifically. I don't know enough to comment and I'm also not a lawyer, uh, but one of the uh, aspect of fighting for to change the custody, one of the requirement for, for going back to court is that there have to be a circumstances, there have to be a substantial change in the circumstances. And so what I can see from what you wrote there, what I could gather is that it seemed like the other parents have been able to claim to the court that there had been a substantial change in the circumstances and therefore it warrant um, 